so who we are. Um, we are Icon. I am the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of the company. We now have 46 people at Icon. Um, we are only two and a half years old, but 46 people. On the right hand side, you see a small group of kind of the founding team um, of Icon. And so before I kind of get into the projects we've done and the technical details and all this, I thought it might make sense to zoom out for a second, kind of remember what we're doing here. Uh, there's 1.2 billion humans who do not have adequate housing uh, across the world. Uh, this is a crisis. This is a housing crisis, uh, not just in San Francisco or in Austin, but this is worldwide. Um, it doesn't matter what continent you go to. We are just not producing housing fast enough uh, and at the cost that we need to. Uh, we need a radical revolution. Um, and so that's kind of the framework for the starting of this presentation. And you guys probably would totally agree with this, but we think that construction just hasn't changed very much throughout history. Um, you know, the power revolution enabled, uh, you know, automated nail guns and this sort of thing, but that's not a zero to one sort of um, reinventing of construction methods. We think we need a, a 10x sort of improvement. We think 3D printing's that change. So ICON, uh, we, what we do, we, we create advanced construction technologies that advance humanity. Uh, and we are a vertically integrated technology company and we focus on the robotics. So this is the printer and the material delivery system, uh, the software, which is the user interface and how you actually use the printer and that sort of thing. And then you've got the materials, which is our proprietary uh, lava crete. So this is a, a cementitious material. Uh, and the Vulcan is uh, a printer that is set up on site. So at Icon, we've got a lot of conviction about printing on site. We think that that um, enables all sorts of efficiencies that are not gained by printing within a warehouse or factory environment and then shipping those components. When you're shipping all those components, there's assembly of all these Lego pieces on the job site, and that is just not at all practical. I think most everyone would agree that printing on site, if you can make it work, is absolutely the way to go. Um, and we think that we've got a, got a solution here. So the specs on the Vulcan 2, it uses 16 kilowatts of power. Uh, it prints at five to seven inches per second in the horizontal direction. Uh, and that's with a, a one inch layer height, so, so rather large, right? We could go even faster if we had a smaller layer, um, but five to seven inches for a one inch layer height. And it weighs about 3,800 pounds and it's got a work area of just shy of 2,000 square feet for kind of most normal projects, but in some cases we've taken on um, prints that were over 2,000 square feet, actually. And so the, the software I was mentioning earlier, we actually have a mobile app for controlling the printer. This is very different than the way it is to control most giant robots. Most giant robots have these ugly user interfaces, and sometimes they call them HMIs, human machine interfaces. The buttons are these ugly colors. You can't figure out which buttons are important, which buttons aren't. Um, that's actually a problem because when you're thinking about scaling construction scale 3D printing, we need to make it very easy for someone who used to be a carpenter, for example, or someone who isn't really technically literate to pick up uh, one of the um, phones and to start printing. And so that's one of our big objectives when we're developing uh, our software. And then the last pillar of our technology has to do with material science. So this is a mix that's developed entirely in-house. It's proprietary. I can't unfortunately share all of the like secret sauce behind this because we are a private company, uh, but I, I can share some specifics um, if, if we wanna talk through those. But uh, our lava creed, as we call it, has 6,000 PSI, which is gonna be a lot stronger than um, most other building materials, concrete slabs, you know, these are averaging 4,000 PSI or so, cinder blocks, 1,500 PSI, and then lumber, even less than that. So we think we've got a pretty great material. Uh, and so without further ado, let's talk about the projects, what we've done. We built the first permitted 3D printed house in the United States. This was kind of like a breakthrough moment as a company. Uh, we printed this in March 2018, just uh, over two years ago now. Um, and the world, I think, first started to realize that concrete 3D printed homes uh, was something that they could imagine themselves living in. Um, this was a house that was beautiful, number one. Number two, uh, permitted. Uh, I think that was the other big thing. Here you've got a certificate of occupancy for this building. 
um, and something we are just so proud of. Today, this building is used actually as a, an office space for ICOM's head of construction. Um, so it's being used every day and we're continuing to get feedback about what it's like to uh, work and live in this structure, uh, which is a big theme of ours at ICOM. It's let's print, let's get feedback, uh, and then let's continue to iterate. Uh, and so once we printed that house, we raised a $9 million series seed round of funding. Um, and basically we took our first printer, what we call the Vulcan One, uh, upgraded that uh, to lead to the product that we now call the Vulcan Two. And the first project that the Vulcan Two built was this welcome center uh, in East Austin um, with an organization called Community First Village. Uh, Community First Village provides housing for people who used to be homeless. Uh, just this amazing organization that does tremendous work. And so we were so glad when they called uh, and asked us to build this welcome center for them. The structure is just a little bit larger than the Chacon house, uh, this house right here, uh, except that it was built in 24 hours of printing time as opposed to 48 hours of printing time. So those 24 hours on this particular build were not continuous. Uh, it was broken up over several days. Um, but it is worth noting 24 hours of, of continuous uh, or of uh, total print time. And we think that continuous printing is very, very feasible. This is an inside look at this house. Uh, worth mentioning that it just looks beautiful, which is something I think we can't, um, you know, totally, uh, you know, forget that we're building houses and what we're really trying to do here is build a structure that is inviting and welcoming and that people actually want to live in. If these houses don't end up looking beautiful, um, we don't have a shot at making this whole industry kind of take off. You gotta think about the people aspect of all this. Uh, and so the, the organization Community First Village, after we built this first welcome center, came back to us and they said, you know, this is pretty awesome. Can you guys do even more? We said, yes. Uh, and we started printing three homes at a time on the same slab. And so, Whereas the first Vulcan uh, had the rail system for a gantry printer on the foundation, this printer had rails totally off the foundation. And so we were able to print from edge to edge to edge, not wasting any slab space whatsoever, which is a big, uh, really important thing when you're trying to save every dollar you can and build the houses for as cheap as possible. And you, up there on the right, you've got a, an overhead shot of what it looks like printing three houses at, at, at the same time with the Vulcan 2. Pretty inspiring. And another thing you can notice actually is that each house floor plan is different than the last, uh, which is something that you can do with 3D printing, right? Not every house needs to be the same. That's something that you guys all know, but uh, it's worth reiterating. Uh, and Tim Shea, he used to be a homeless person in Austin living on the streets. He has now moved into this house and giving us feedback which is just an amazing story uh, and something that uh, is just so cool. I, I spoke to, to Tim just over two weeks ago and he was just so happy to be in his 3D printed house. Um, again, pretty cool story. Uh, and so while we were printing these homes at Community First Village, we had another print crew actually going down to Mexico with an almost more ambitious uh, goal, which was to print the world's first 3D printed community. So this is not just a single house all by itself, but a row of homes, a neighborhood. Um, and we pulled it off. Uh, homes, the, the family over here on the right-hand side, the, this is a family that has moved in uh, into this house and is giving us feedback on what it's like to live in these printed houses. Just so cool. Um, this is a video of what it was looked like to print um, in uh, this remote village of, of Mexico. You can see that you got two Houses being printed at the same time. Um, yeah, just looks quite amazing. Um, and at this point, we were also printing each house in 24 hours of print time. So 48 hours of print time for both houses, but each house uh, 24 hours of print time. Uh, but again, there were many challenges to making this happen. When you're printing in a very remote village, uh, you have all sorts of issues. Uh, on the right hand side, you've got a picture of uh, the job site that flooded one day. And so some of the operators actually had to put on these big boots and walk to the job site. And you know, storage of all this material, how do you do that in a remote village? Uh, well, you need a tent and you need people to kind of uh, manage that, that job site, it's not tricky. A lot of the challenges weren't actually just uh, so much technical as they were operational, believe it or not. 
And the, the last big thing with this Mexico project had to do with uh, the fact that it was actually in a seismic zone. Uh, and not that I'm not aware of anyone actually having built a house in a seismic zone, but uh, this was really quite tricky. This is a map of all the earthquakes in Mexico over the past 10 years. Many, many very large earthquakes. Uh, and actually, I think it was about a month ago, there was a 7.4 um, magnitude earthquake that hit uh, about 350 miles away from the job site. And the houses are all still standing, uh, not a single crack, um, all structurally intact, which is just amazing. The uh, electrical panel that provides power to the printer and to the material delivery system, though, did not hold up uh, through this earthquake, which is pretty cool to see. Another project uh, was one that we completed uh, in July of 2020, and this was in cooperation with the Department of Defense. We went to Camp Pendleton and printed a vehicle hide. So this is a structure that can basically camouflage a vehicle like the one you see on the right here from drones and overhead surveillance and this sort of thing. Uh, and what this looked like in video form was printing directly on the ground. So we did not set up a foundation in this particular instance. We printed directly on the ground. This is something that the DOD has given us a lot of feedback on. They say, you know, setting up a foundation maybe makes that first couple layers easier, but it makes uh, the total print time a lot, um, it just takes a lot longer, right? So if you can go without a foundation, that's, that's really great. Um, and so once we printed these structures, we actually tilted them 90 degrees and then assembled them, which is something that we had never done before. Um, but working with the really bright, creative structural engineer, we were able to pull it off out of uh, the, the project. Uh, but so that's, that's kind of the past. Uh, we are still kind of looking to the future and we're still doing uh, printing projects as we speak. We've got many projects that I unfortunately can't talk about, but I can kind of hint at this one. So this is a project that we are doing at 17th Street uh, here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I won't share the specific ad address, but uh, this is a project we're doing in Austin and we actually finished printing uh, serial number 00017 uh, house. So this is our 17th printed house. Um, and we think the layer quality is just amazing. They, the, the, our amazing operations team finished printing this house uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and so this is uh, something we're, we're just really proud of. Lots of details I could share here, but for the, the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in talking to us at ICON, uh, you want to work at ICON, uh, please email me at alex at iconbuild.com or you can view job openings and apply directly at iconbuild.com. Uh, and if you've got any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's it's really great just seeing you present because I remember when you was a graduate student, uh, not graduate, when you graduated from Baylor. So it's been great to see how your career has um, progressed and, and changed. And we thank you for all that you're doing in terms of this area within 3D printing and advancing some materials. Okay, so we have a couple of questions here. You kind of addressed this a little bit with this last, um, um, with the military one. But there was a question regarding foundations and whether you're actually tying it to the slab. So is, are there any connections between the structure and the foundation? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So our structural engineers recommend a coil rod method of reinforcing the vertical um, uh, cores. And so uh, once we print the first couple of layers, we then go back in and we uh, drill into the foundation. Uh, this, the place for, for coal rods to actually be anchored into the foundation via a, a very strong adhesive epoxy. Thank you. Um, there's a question about the cost. Um, what is the current cost of printing? And I know it's going to depend on the job, but if you could give a, a range. Yeah, unfortunately, that's one that I really can't share at this point. Um, it just varies so much based on location, geography. Um, to kind of give a range would just be kind of... Um, you know, not really appropriate. It, we would love to talk um, details and, and specifics of this nature, if y'all would like, um, but let's engage as like, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the sense of like taking out a project together or something like that. that that's where <laughs> details are, can be shared. 
I love it. Um, there's a question about reinforcement. Are you using reinforcement? And if so, what type are you using? Yeah, so in, in the vertical direction, we are using um, coil rods, right? Um, and in the horizontal direction, we've tried all sorts of different things. We've tried uh, masonry wire ladder. Um, we've tried uh, cables, tried basalt fiber, um, you know, non-conductive uh, reinforcing. We're, we're always trying new different things um, to see how they perform. Uh, but there's definitely reinforcing in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. Okay. And then I think the last question I'm going to ask from these is, you mentioned earthquake prone zones. Have, have you evaluated the structure for resistance and like um, with respect to earthquakes and what's the long-term performance, which may be hard for you to, <laughs> to answer that question right now. Yeah, no, this is a very good question. So we, we did not take on that project in Mexico uh, willy-nilly. We, we engaged um, several structural engineering firms and have done a good amount of structural testing in particular, looking at the adhesion between layers um, in shear. From our understanding, that's kind of like one of the biggest factors to printing in seismic zones. And so uh, we, we, we've looked at uh, adhesives to put uh, on cold joints um, and, and this sort of thing. We've done a whole, whole study of um, you know, what works well and what doesn't work well. And we think we've got a pretty good solution for printing in seismic zones.